everybody, welcome back to my channel. I hope you all are good, safe, and blessed abundantly. My name is Nomalong Yelamaku for those who don't know, and I welcome you to this amazing channel. It is fun here, it is everything and more. Today's episode, we are talking all things medical, doctor, or a doctor's profession. I hope that you will really enjoy it. And yeah, I have a special guest, she'll introduce herself. And if you have any questions for her, please just comment down below. And also, um, just ask her. I think you can also follow her on Instagram. Right? Instagram. Yes, she's on Instagram. I'll link her um, Instagram handle. And please DM her only medical related stuff, right? So yeah, please introduce yourself. <laughs> um, hi guys. So my name is Lepan I am a medical doctor in my county service here. I keep saying this here. My name is Dr. Lebahang Lisi and Klapo. I'm going to get you oh. to it. Yes. So, yes. meet Mrs. Mm -hmm. Um Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, sure. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, I'm going to ask her questions, right? Um, as I said, I'm going to be looking down on the questions. And please just feel free also to ask questions, as I said. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And yeah, let's get straight into this video. <laughs> Sorry. Um, how did you get into medicine? So, I applied in my matric year. Uh -huh. And I did not make it, guys. Imagine, this pretty face did not make it. So, I applied in my matric year. I didn't get space. I got rejected. Okay. Um, then I went into a different degree altogether. Um, and in the second year, I was applying again for medicine because I truly felt called to that profession, right? Okay. And so I did not feel comfortable, and I was actually miserable uh -huh. in, in the other degree I was studying at the time. Uh -huh. Do you mind sharing which degree? <laughs> I okay. do, because I just feel I'm miserable. So people in that okay. field will think that I want to make them miserable. Okay, no. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. If I think it's a bit miserable. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it's also in, in, in the health sciences, but it was not for me. So if you're doing that, that degree and you're loving it and that's where God called you to be, absolutely, it's wonderful, but it was not for me. Okay. Um, and so then I started looking again to apply into medicine, like studying really, really hard to make sure that at least my marks were, you know, like were really proper. Okay. And then I found out through a friend about a scholarship to Cuba. So you didn't know Cuba by that time? I did not. Imagine, yeah. I did not. So in my mind, I was very narrow-minded in the sense that, you know, Vits, UP, Medunza, UCT, locally. Mm -hmm. It never dawned on me to think, broaden your horizons, okay. you know, like the world is your oyster. Um, and so then when I found out about the Cuban bursary, I thought, why not? And honestly, when I first applied to it, I was not convinced that I was going to make I don't know. I think a part of me was still, I'm trying my chances. Uh -huh. And then when it did eventually happen, it's like, oh, okay, I actually have the brains for this, you know? So um, so that's how I got into medicine. I didn't get um, into it, like, from the get-go. And I think that's where most people get discouraged. Yeah. Where you apply for it and you don't get it. And then you go do a BSc and then you go do, like, your your, your master's. And then by the time you realize, like, I'm too old anyway, I'm not going back. Uh. So, I don't know, just go for it. If you want to go for it. Uh. Okay. But then by that time, did you, was your marks like really good? No. Okay, not like, they were not. <laughs> you know, because medicine, I also That's had this thing idea. about it to say, no, and medicine, you need 90s and above. Shame, so I did not no. even have that. Okay. That's, that's, that's what I think made me feel um, not worthy or not competent enough. Okay. So I was not like, like I think people who know me, like, I'm, I'm, I'm very hardworking, right? I'm, I'm, like, I study hard and whatever. But I'm not your 90s child, guys. I'm not the 10 distinctions that I'm doing, like, extra subjects. No, I wasn't. Literally, I wasn't average, but I wasn't overly above average either. So I just really worked hard. Um, had a few distinctions here and there, but I promise you, it was not 90, 90, 100, 90. No, no, no. Some of them are just, like, you know, like, I struggled with, math with mathematics. Um, so my math mark is far from a distinction. And I'm a doctor today. So I think if you really want something and you've trusted God about that thing, things like marks should not hold you back from applying. Yeah. Which I think for mm. me could have happened. Mm -hmm. um, but I just trusted that this is where I truly feel that I'm called to. And so um, my matric marks were like, okay, like they were good. 
So then um, I had to work hard on my first and second when year. When you say good, sorry, average, like... No, not, not like average, average. Like just 70s? Yes, 70s, um, 70s, 80s. Like I don't have anything like in the 90s. Not in my LO's 90, no, please. Okay. Like I'm like a normal child, guys. My brain's, my brain's like normal. <laughs> All right, yeah. okay. So now you applied and take us through that Cuba process. Yo, it's a mess. No, it's not really a mess. Applications are open, by the way. If you're in Houting, the Cuban bursary applications are open. And I think they could on the 30th of November, if I'm not mistaken. No one will confirm that. Yeah, well, you see. Um, but yes, um, you. so the ad was in a newspaper. Okay. And then it was also on the radio. Um, thereafter, you could get application forms from like the big hospitals. So at the time, I was at Medunsa. So I just went to Medunsa. I think I went to the HR department. And I said I wanted um, the application forms. They gave them to me. I filled them out, and I had to drop them off at at the time it was at Fox Street, the old Department of Health building in Joburg. So got a taxi, went to Joburg to drop it off. Uh -huh. And one of the things that the devil does is to fool you and to clear with your mind. When I got there, the box of application forms, my God, it was so full. Really? Like, it was overflowing. Like, it was... And it's these big... You know, like, the, the, like it's a big box up to there, like... Where is it? Is it next to, like, a security guard? It's or by a because... security guard by the lifts. So, so you, don't, you don't even get inside to be like, hi... This is mine, you know. Mm. Like, so it's like you're doing basically a job application. It's like a job application. And what they wanted was that filled application form mm -hmm. with your CV. Okay. So there had to be a CV with it. And obviously, I'm post-metric um, in my second year. That's the only thing that I have on my, on my CV. Mm. So I had to, like, guys, if I tell you that I pumped my CV up, I printed my CV on, on cardboard paper. I, yes. <laughs> I don't know. It is just, I don't know what it was. Okay. But, like, I just wanted my scene to stand out. So I printed it on, on cardboard paper mm -hmm. and I wrote like a proper mission statement. I'm like going, I'm passionate, I'm, I'm, I'm hardworking, I'm ambitious, you know? Because then all I had was um, like in education, um, the trick, <laughs> and um, my two years of my previous degree. Um, I didn't really have much volunteering, but I did work at church, not uh -huh. work, but like serve at church. Uh -huh. So I added that as like part of leadership, um, that I was yeah, in the leadership. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Cause I was trying to make my CV stand out because I mean, uh. yo, I don't really have anything else. Uh. And so, yes, I take my application form, I drop it off in the box uh -huh. and I leave and I was a bit discouraged because I'm like, oh my God. What are the people who are better than me out there? Like my marks are okay, but not, they're not great. You know, yeah. like it's not like nineties and nineties and nineties. Mm. And the other prerequisite was that you offer me disadvantaged background. Okay. And so my mother's a nurse, so okay. automatically they remove the disadvantage from that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So then I was like, yo, I'm not gonna get it because I'm not poor enough. Yeah. yeah. You know, kind of things. Honestly, that that was the thought that um. I'm not disadvantaged enough to uh -huh. to qualify. Uh -huh. But either way, I qualified. I called my parents and my mom's like, just pray about it, pray about it, trust God for this. So how do you know that you qualified? Did they call you to say that you qualify or what? Yeah, so then you get a phone call. Hello, uh -huh. um, at the time it was Mabule. Hello, it was Mabule. Yes, Mabule calls you. Hello, this is Mabule from the Department of Health. Um, they didn't you know that we'd like you to come in for an interview. Okay, so go through an interview. You go through an interview. Uh -huh. So interview done, we went there. The room was full of people. Some people are standing, like the chairs are full. And obviously, when you start thinking, am I gonna qualify? But anyway, you go in for your, for your interview and they ask you, you know, can you work well with people? Can you work well under pressure? Uh -huh. How will you be when you are um, away from home for so long? How will you cope? And then other questions that at the time didn't really make much sense to me uh -huh. was if you were to live with 12 other people in a room, would you be okay with it? And obviously you want the, the scholarship. Yes. So the first answer is yes. yes. Uh, like, yes, uh, I am going to be fine. Uh, Turns out that's exactly how you're going to be living. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we laugh about it now because we're on the other side. Yes. Uh, but I promise you when you're going through it, it's like, is, is this really worth it? Like, uh, why am I taking myself through this? But yeah. So find interviews done. Then you get told, okay, you've been shorted from the interview process. Now you must go for a health check. Okay. Health check done. They did like for ladies, it was pregnancy test. Uh -huh. and then, um, so if you're pregnant, pregnant, that's oh. where you're gone. Right. And the people who 
fell pregnant. So they used to call it goodbye sex. Okay. So you had goodbye sex. You are negative. Yay. You fly. You get there two weeks later. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's like, poof, you're positive. Back home. So then when you get there, they check you again. No one really checked you again. But I think you would start feeling the signs of pregnancy. Okay. And then so if the moment they find out. You are gone. Like, okay, you, all right. it's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so that means, let's say you are in your fourth year. Same Sorry. thing. So in fourth year, different different provinces work differently. So some provinces would say to you, okay, fine, we'll send you home, you have your delivery, and you'll come back. Okay. Some provinces will go as far as saying, once you are pregnant, your scholarship is terminated. So obviously, if you know that, you know, you want, mm. you know what I mean, you need to be extra careful because you're mm. going to lose your scholarship. So there are people who, like, fell pregnant first year, second year, and it just ended there for them. Cool. You know what I mean? I mean, a yeah. child is a, is a okay. gift from God, yeah. but now losing a scholarship that you've worked so hard for. Yeah. And for yeah. most of us, we didn't come from homes that could pay for your medical school tuition, J, and uh -huh. just take you to school. So losing that was losing quite a big thing, uh -huh. you know? Um, but yeah, we got our medical test done, did our eye tests, and then results came back and tell you, okay, your tests are fine, you're on to the next stage. Uh -huh. Sorry, there's something that I heard, and I don't know if it's very true about mm, it. Okay. That when you, like, they check your HIV test, yes. right? And then when you're positive, you, you lose it. So I can't really comment in terms of the losing it part, because mm -hmm. we also heard the same thing. I also heard the same thing. But I never saw anybody okay. who was HIV positive and then got turned back. Okay. But we all knew this whole thing that if you are HIV positive, you can't go to Cuba. But I can't really deny or say it's true because i never thought myself it was just a rumor that we knew was going on but also i think the, the reason for that was because um like in cuba there's no hiv is that true so um like, it's 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 not entirely true mm -hmm. it's true in the sense that they're very very controlled hiv population they're okay. a very controlled population and it's not something you see as much as you do in South Africa. Okay. But HIV is all over the world, guys. Like, wherever a man and a woman meet and they have sex, HIV will be there. Because okay. there's still infidelity. But their rates are super, 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 super low. That okay. When we were students, we hardly saw HIV positive patients. Uh -huh. You might see one in, like, your whole year uh -huh. at a time. Um, like, in whatever rotation you were in. So it's not very common. Yeah. But it does exist. Okay. You can't. All right. So that's how you got into medicine. Yes, it's okay. in Cuba. Yeah, it's sorry, guys. Yeah, it is actually okay. <laughs> so then now when you get this, um, like, do you learn the, is it Cuban or Korean or something like that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. what, what, what language is it? Spanish. Yeah, Spanish. So it's from Korea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Spanish, yes. So you get there, um, mm -hmm. you start your first, so your pre-med, yeah. So okay. pre-med, you do Spanish. So the Spanish one, Spanish two. And then you do like your pre-medical sciences. So you go back to doing, what do you do? Like biology and like some like some flimsy courses. I can't remember them now, but like. Is it the same as like high school? Like the content like, you call Yes, yeah, so some of the things were a bit like high schoolish. Uh -huh. um, like language, so the, the language is Spanish, but language one language two, so Spanish one Spanish two. And then like writing essays and, and things like that. And then we did, there was something called Aprender a Aprender, which is like learn how to learn. So that it, it, it was like courses like that. Okay. It wasn't like like serious, like you are learning like a big thing, not really. Uh -huh. But yeah, like you do like some biology or some life science content uh -huh. in, in within that first year. But most of us never even really got that first year because we were always late. Because government always sent us late. Is it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 the academic year starts in September, uh -huh. but I left South Africa in December. So September, October, December, November. Yeah. December, it was the year Nelson Mandela died. <laughs> the five, I went to Cuba. Or five or ten, somewhere there. So you did not spend Christmas at home then? No, December. no, I did. So I flew on the 26th. Yes, yeah, so we left okay. December 26th. Okay. Yeah, we left December 26th, got to Cuba December 28th. I think it was a two-day flight. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but we were supposed to leave earlier, obviously, because the school year starts in September. Mm. But, you know... So how long did you study in Cuba? So you're in Cuba for six years, uh -huh. and you're back home for 18 months. For 18 months, yes. 
So only those seven and a half, more or less. Okay. And then, um, why do you guys need to come to South Africa? Um, so you come back for integration, uh -huh. um, back into the South African system, where you are then exposed to all the things that you are exposed to, both in terms of pathology and practical skills. Okay. So um, a lot of people will judge human trained um, students if you come back for like not being able to take bloods, put up catheters. Because in Cuba, there are technicians for that. There are people for that. Okay. So every ward has its own phlebotomist. Okay. So you can learn um, should you put yourself there, but it's not everyone who gets the opportunity to learn and to do some of the procedures, like lumbar punches and things. Some people came back being confident in doing them. Some people had done them but were not confident yet. Mm -hmm. So that integration year is just to make sure that we're all on the same level in terms of confidence and um, competency. Mm -hmm. So you just want to build competency in the last 18 months in terms of now South African disease profile and not just Cuban thinking. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, would, so then what is the difference between studying here and, and being in Cuba? Apart from the emotional difference of not having your family, uh -huh. of not having the food you like eating, of not having your culture around you, uh -huh. which also takes its own um, emotional toll on you, right? Uh -huh. Like that, that, that does, a lot of people will come back with depression out of not having seen their parents oh, for at least yes. two, three years. That's because I mean, if you're gone there for first year, well, for pre-med, then for first year, and then you only come back in second year. So that's only in your third year, you're only seeing your family. And mm. you get home and you find out people have passed away. Yeah. Relations are not okay. the same. Some people like you have mm. boyfriends and girlfriends, you come back, it's like, mm. oh no, I've moved on. Mm. So apart from that emotional aspect of it, disease profile is different. Trauma profile is different. Uh -huh. um, so you're exposed to different things, but you're always exposed to the same medicine, mm. right? You, we are taught the same illnesses, but in terms of managing those illnesses, that's where the difference comes in. So it, it takes time, honestly, when you come back to get used to seeing like a malnourished child. Why are you seeing a malnourished child in 20, 23 or whatever? Because you hardly see such things. Why are you seeing HIV that's like now gone to full blown AIDS? Yeah. Why are you seeing TB? So these are the things that we did not know how to, 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 to really manage. Like you, you've read about it and now you're seeing it practically mm. and it's overwhelming the system completely. Yeah. You know, you're seeing defaulters, not just HIV, but like hypertensives, diabetics, you name it, and you'll see this poor control. So the lovely thing about cure that we learned was the the power of, 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 of primary health care yes. in, in instilling yes, yes, yes. patient education, teaching compliance. Um, th there's a lot in this system that prevents people from falling through the cracks. Yeah. And so that's one thing that shocks you when you get home where patients are, are lost to follow up, patients are not taking the medication uh -huh. anymore. Uh -huh. And you think to yourself, where are where are the primary health care doctors and what's going on with the system? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's a big shock when you come back. But I mean, you wanna be a doctor, so you push through. You, you push through. Uh -huh. Like this you push through and, and you find a way. So how was your experience? Overall in Cuba, how was your experience? Hi guys, me I'm easy, hey. Like me I had a good time. Don't get me wrong. Uh -huh. There are times where you go through tough times. Even if you're in South Africa, there are times where you miss home, you miss the food you eat. But if you focus on that, you're going to lose the, the experience of everything else going on around you. Um, so for me, I had a great time, right? Mm -hmm. I joined church, I was quite active in church. Um, I had a good circle of friends. And like, it's an island. So you're not going to the beach sometimes, you go to carnivals. So if, like I had a good time because I allowed myself to be immersed in the culture. Yeah. The time where I lived outside and not just in residence. So I lived with a Cuban family um, and they cooked for me. Oh, really? Yes. So you don't stay at rest? You do stay at rest, but like you move out, no ma. Because like I'm not going to live with like 11 yeah. other girls in the room, so there's 12 of us. Oh, yeah. uh, so once so you get smart, okay. Once you get smart, you find a, a casa, you find a house to rent or a room to rent. Um, oh, you're renting. Basically. You're renting, basically. Cottage. Like, yes, okay. right? You're renting. And so a lot of the times, the Cubans like would be really happy to have you, mm. so they like cook for you. And if you had a really nice mamita, mm. she'd like bring you food and check on you. So a lot of us like as soon as you got wise enough, <laughs> taking is not allowed. But you know, yeah. I mean, guys, comfort. And then this, you guys got a stipend. We did get a stipend. Um, so our stipend was two hundred dollars, uh -huh. which was more, way more than what a typical fa Cuban family made. 
Really? Mm. Humans are quite poor people, Is right? It? Poor in terms of money, but like rich in terms of personality and love. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah, when you got there, I mean, you have $200. And for some of them, it's like a $10 week. Yeah. You know, that's that's what they're making. Mm. And so they can barely afford it. So, I mean, okay, I'll just yeah. convert it. It's fine. No, no, sure. No. Oh, like the conversions. Yeah. Remember now to um, think about, look at the, the exchange rates at the time. But also, we changed to the, so the dollar is then changed to the Cuban peso. Uh -huh. So at, um, when I was there, one Cuban dollar was 24 pesos. Okay. So it's a lot of conversion, but at the end of the day, it was, it was, it was decent money. Uh. Yeah, it was decent money. You could afford to rent out like a decent house or room or whatever. Is and it, still enjoy yourself. Is it decent enough to like send money home? Um, what? some people say they did, uh -huh. but it's not that decent, honestly. Okay. If if you if you want to say you're sending money home to support your family, uh -huh. uh, it's not that level. Uh -huh. And this really then you when you are ninjing yourself. Okay. Um, like some of the basic things, because remember now, there's no direct bank to send to SA from Cuba. Like it, it, it has to, it has a lot like with cell phone roaming and self, like people would have to, you'd have to find people who know how to do it. It's not a very easy thing to do to send money home. Okay. Um, and so some people then would have people sending them money to Cuba. Uh -huh. Because I mean, sometimes if you're a bit irresponsible and like sometimes things are hard to find, like you go to the shop, there's no, there's no soap, there's no toothpaste. There is no food. Yeah, there's girl. no basic things. There are times when it gets that tough. Why? Because Cuba is under the U.S. embargo, so it's like a blockade. It's called the blockade of an, an economic blockade. Um, due to its political stance, mm -hmm. um, economically, it's it can't freely trade can't freely trade with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So there are times where you really lack basic necessities. So, so when we lived, they told us. Pack your pads, pack your toilet paper, like, pack your match. like pack much. And so it's not that every time you go to a shop you won't find it. Mm -hmm. But so maybe seven times out of ten when you go to a shop you won't find it. Mm -hmm. So the like those are things that you have to bear in mind. If you're a person who honestly would not survive with a bit of struggle, mm -hmm. then cure would definitely not be for you. But I mean if you're willing like if you pack your things properly, if you tell yourself in a month I'm going to use four toilet rolls and I'm going to Cuba now for two years, and you calculate how many you need and you pack it in, then you'll be fine. So, as a, a student in Cuba, do you guys do rotations? Like, take us through those years. How did it work? Sure. Okay, so, like, in the medical school, Nzansi versus Cuba versus Italy versus China, you rotate through the big specialties uh -huh. um, per your years, right? So, in Kilhead with what was called in third year, when you now put in the hospital, we started with what was called Propedotica, uh -huh. right? What is that? Um, so it's literally like a, <laughs> a rotation of signs and symptoms. Okay. So it's the start of like internal med kind of vibes. So it's like internal medicine, but it's not just internal medicine based. Uh -huh. It's based on physical exam, like interpreting x-rays, ECGs. So it's basically investigations, okay. right? Uh -huh. So it's just it's just a subject for that, uh -huh. and then in the second semester of third year, you then get into internal medicine. Yeah, now it's internal med. Like the same internal med you see here, uh -huh. there's a see in Cuba. However, like I said, the disease profile is different. Yes. So you're not seeing people with cocoa meningitis, T meningitis. You're just seeing all people with the renal phase and heart failures, yes. right? Then you go into fourth year. I might now be um, mistaken in terms of how I mentioned them, but then you go through peds, orthopedics. Um, general so, surgery, anesthesia. So that's basically thing. it's the same. It's the same mm. things. It's just again also the depth at, at which they taught. So there's some things that in Kyo we taught very superficially, right? That we'll admit to. We taught very superficially because they are specialist managed. So you would basically identify it to the specialist. Okay. Whereas back home, a lot of the things you manage at your little district hospital or a regional hospital, or whatever. And so we had to know a lot of. Same thing mm. with anesthesia. Mm. Uh, a lot of us in anesthesia, we went there, we saw the machines for like a week or two. So it's a very short rotation. But at home, you're expected to be able to administer anesthesia and work as an anesthetic doctor, even in an internship. Whereas with Cubans, that's not really expected of them. Mm. So we went through the same rotations, but the day that some things were taught and not taught is different. Mm. 
And so that's where the struggle comes in, in terms of now during that integration period, people think, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, but I do know, but I was not expected to know it at this level. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that um, I think discouraged a lot of us when we came back was that South African um, trained doctors see, are seen, maybe they do the internal medicine in third year and again in fifth year or sixth year. And so when oh. we come back, we're joining them in that sixth year, right? And so you'd have the professor saying, I taught you this in third year. Mm -hmm. I was not there, I was in yes. Cuba. So yes. they'd say things like, no, we're not gonna go into depth into this, you guys learned it before. But I didn't learn it before and I don't know how you ask the questions. And so obviously now when I'm in the ward round with them, I'm gonna seem like I'm incompetent because uh. I, w I don't have a third year notes. And some people, honestly, and this is the truth, would withhold notes from treatment from human trained students. Yes, that is drama. The students, the students themselves. Student. The Why? students who said, we are taking their place. Right? We're taking their place, we're taking their, their, their patients. So there's a lot of resistance okay. where you think to yourself, at least I'm back home, I'm among my people. Because, I mean, there are Cubans who don't like us being there. Uh, so in your mind, true. it's, I'm going home to receive my yes. people and to get here and people don't like you. Uh, just because you're from Cuba. And then they get to know you. Gonna, I don't understand yes, why. Then they get to know you and they're like, oh, yes, you're not bad for a Cuban trained. And that in itself is not a compliment. That is not a compliment for you to tell me, yes, you are good for a Cuban trained doctor. Because the same people that you are discouraging and feeling bad about are your colleagues. Uh, so if you are seeing somebody struggling, should you not, as a fellow doctor, then say, hey, I've got these notes that can help you that we had in third year. Yeah. And so this is the problem for us. We, we didn't really have a lot of people who are willing to share resources. And so now you are trying to then find um, senior Cuban trained who are now, now interns or whatever, who are, who are now working mm. to get them to help you with the notes. Yeah. What should not be the case when I come back from, from, from Cuba, I'm hoping that my classmates who are South African trained can welcome me back and help the integration process go much smoother. And so that's when Vitz then, I think, then saw that there's still, there's still not working. So in Vitz, Cuban trained students come back from Cuba and are in their own class by themselves. That's better. Yes and no. Okay. So it's better because now it's just you and yourselves and you learn at your own pace as a group. Uh -huh. However, doctors would have this mentality that I don't get paid to teach you. Jani, because I'm also a student, like a South African trained student. Uh -huh. And so you get rotations where people would not really pay much attention to you because now you guys are the Cuban group. Uh -huh. And so then you're called the Cubans. Uh, where are the Cubans? But then when oh. you go to a hospital, you go also as Cuba uh, students. Yes. Oh, okay. I thought maybe in the class mm -hmm. only, but then even you in the hospital, hospital, you are put. So we were paid. It was myself and a friend of mine, my level. We were put in a hospital and we were rotating there together. Mm. So when 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 there were um, South African trained um, students at the time, we would meet them, for example, in the ward round. Uh -huh. But we weren't really having a lot of interaction with them. Okay. So in a sense, it was good and bad, right? Because if it's good that we get to see ourselves and not feel shy. And excuse me, and embarrassed out of uh, about some of the things that we don't know. But it was bad because then the the reception at times. Uh, sorry, oh my god. And I don't know, the effort from the doctors was not not the one, man, to be honest. Mm. Sure, okay. So now finally you do your rotations and then when do you come to South Africa? You come back at the end of fifth year. So Gindo Anya's fifth year. When you finish your fifth year, you come back to SA to then join sixth year. Okay. Or, so technical sixth year. So it's integration for that 18 months. So that 18 months is like our final year, basically. Uh -huh. The first six months, um, some, university, some universities will say it does not count, but some will actually count it towards your final mark. So okay. when you come back, then you do the sixth year rotation. So internal medicine, obstetrics, um, also PEDICS, we also did some anesthesia. What we didn't do though a lot of was public health because we come from a strong public health yes, background. Yes, so that's yes, primary yes. healthcare we didn't really focus a lot on. It was just the the in hospital rotations. Okay. So do you choose for yourself where you wanna go or they choose for you? Like which university? You write a list uh -huh. with your five choices. Oh it's five choices. It's five choices. Uh -huh. And then you trust God in heaven to put you at your number one choice. Uh -huh. Because the, um there are universities that take very few students. Uh -huh. So there was a lot of people applying and things you don't have a way of gauging 
of who's applying because you are at your university i'm at mm. mine sometimes it's at theirs and you just hope that you're one of they say they want 10 or 20 students you're one of the 10 or 20 that, that applied if there's more than that you get your second option and if your second option is full you get your third if it's full you get your fourth if it's full you get your fifth and some people don't even get the option so what do they do now oh they go to wherever they're placed huh you go to wherever you're placed so if you applied for this uh -huh. and you end up getting let's say kid it in and you don't want it and you can't swap because you, oh, you can find, swap yeah you can okay. because i mean if if now i don't want the place that they've placed me at I can try to swap with somebody else who's there and who doesn't want to be there. Uh, but finding a swap again is challenging, especially with like people who mostly want to go to Vert, Medunza, you know, like some people from Kizadem want to go back to Kizadem. Uh, but if all those are full, you will go to UCT, you will go to Wusu, uh, and yeah, and Zimbabwe as well. So yeah. you must just be positive, but not completely um, hopeless if you don't get your choice. Uh, you are in vets, finished, now you pass. Do you guys write board exams or what happens? Yes, in actually, this? we write a Cuban exam called Estatal. In Cuba? No, in SA. Remember, this is the end of your, of your integration year. Okay. So at the end of your, of your integration year, there's an exam, uh -huh. a Cuban exam in Spanish. So it's only the Cuba people that write it? Yes, it's, it's a Cuban trained doctor, um, students who write the, the Estatal. Um, it's at one central place. I mean, no, no, it's, it's two places now. In this, at, at first it was one, so all of you would come from wherever you're coming from universities to rest at one place. Uh -huh. But now it's been it's separated. So Gauteng uh, being Vids, UP, Medunza would write at the same place. And then Wusuki then also writes at the same place. Mm -hmm. But basically you're writing the same exam. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's just like one big final exam of anything you've gone through in medical school. So you wrote in, in Spanish? In Spanish, yes. And then the South African ones, they write in English. Is it not the same paper that you guys are writing? No, no, no. Really? Yes, but that is just for Cuban trained doctors. Uh -huh. It's not for South African trained. They don't write it. So they can go to Cuba. Yeah, I understand. But like a board exam, I thought it's going to be like one thing. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. as... No, no, no. We write this, but that. Okay. So you finish your integration, you finish your exams that you were writing in, in SA, uh -huh. and once you passed that, Wait, this so is your license to write this letter. Oh, so firstly you, um, you wrote finish. the South African one. Yes. So this is with the whole, um, but it's also the South African student. So the South African student, you write your own exam, like, uh -huh. you write your obstetrics gynae, you write your internal medicine, your surgery, whatever, uh -huh. and then you pass it and, and that's done. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so okay. when that is done, we then have to write the exam, the, the Cuban board exam. Oh, you know what I thought board exam was? Because for us, the board exam was like, it, it's inclusive of everything. Everything. Yes. everything. Not when I'm finished a rotation, mm -hmm. then I write a thing. That's how they did it. Um, you guys. The South Africans. Okay. We had our board exam. Uh -huh. You wrote the Cuban board exam. Uh -huh. The Cuban is that. Um, so basically, you are qualified by passing all your certificate exams and by passing your statal. Yeah. So you can't fail either one and, and, and graduate. So you have to pass all the, the South African integration year you have to pass and the Cuban exam you have to pass and then you can only then only can you qualify. Okay. Okay. No, understandable. So now you're a doctor, you passed at graduation. Congratulations. Yes. I didn't go to graduation. Let's move on. Okay. <laughs> I did not go to my graduation. Um, you didn't wear the gown. I did not wear the gown. I keep telling myself that I'm going to, you know, okay. when I now specialize. Okay. But I didn't go to my graduation. Today I regret it. Not regret, but I feel a bit sad about it. Yeah. Um, I really didn't have the desire to go. Uh -huh. Because when I felt like, ah, it's such like glitz and glam. I'm not a very glitz and glam person. And it was held in... The was, where was our graduation? I can't remember. So you're not in vet? No. Oh, so we, when I graduate, we graduate with the We don't, we don't graduate with the South So it's trains. different with you it's guys. It's different. So we have our own graduation. Okay. And our graduation, I was working now in my internship year. Uh -huh. So to not get that 
two days off mm -hmm. to now travel for my graduation was also another problem. Okay. Where we had like heads of department saying, ah, ah, nah, you know, it's not part of your leave, wada, wada, wada. So it, like for some people, it was hard to time, it was hard to get the time off work. Yeah. And then for me, I was like, mm, I'll, I'll use it as, I'll use it as an excuse. And my parents said that no one come. Really? <laughs> okay. No one's in It keeps getting worse, guys. Nah. Yo, Jesus. <laughs> All right, so now you had to choose where you're going to do your internship. Mm. So take us through that. Where did you do your internship? What did you do? Which hospital did you choose? So now choose? it goes back to now the integration, right? Uh -huh. So now we are considered South African trains um, because we're all in the same system. Okay. Right? Yes. So you're all in the same system. And so it's ICSP. You create an account and you put your choices five choices um and it's it actually is changing every year now because now the interns this year i think can't choose like priority one hospitals anymore and they can't choose how they that's crazy okay. but anyway at the time um you could only choose i think two provincial hospitals and there is had to be either regional or or district hospitals that you're choosing uh, so you don't do clinics no okay. yeah internship is not done at clinics okay. you're rotated at a clinic but you can't work at a clinic as a primary place of employment okay I so sure i worked at timbisa i chose timbisa because i was from vid circuits and i wanted something outside of Joburg. Uh -huh. and a friend of mine was like come be timbisa go to timbisa and i learn this exposure what do i do what do i do what do i do but she was telling me a dream a... because as much as this exposure girl the price you're paying is your mental health guys nice. so the one thing to bear in mind when choosing a hospital is the big hospitals with exposure, you're gonna pay for that exposure mm. with your mental health, with chronic fatigue, with lack of sleep, like you know. Yeah. So I, I, so I, also people who choose Steve also will be like, mm, well, that's my opinion. Hate me if you will. I am not of the opinion that interns should go to Steve Biko. Okay. It's too specialized. It's too tertiary, and so. A lot of the interns who go they depend a lot on the registrars which is good because then you, you have ample supervision however in terms of practical skills a lot of them that i have worked with okay. were lacking in that in, in that aspect right so it was like Tembisa, where you don't really have a lot of senior doctors okay. you do have they're there and you have some supervision but a lot of the things you will be fit to do them whereas at a hospital like steve beaker with a lot of registrars and super specialized there's always a registrar to do something that is a bit more above you. Uh. So, for example, like cutting C-section. Some of them, I've met colleagues who are now in their concert year and will say, I'm not comfortable cutting a C-section. Uh, okay. You understand? Know, and during your internship year, that's when you're supposed to learn it. So imagine now you want to do obstetrics and gynecology, for example, and you can't cut a C-section, and now you come into ComServ, and people are like, but you're already ComServ. Shouldn't you know this by now? Uh. You know? So... In terms of big hospitals, I would say go to big hospitals, but don't go to big, super specialized hospitals uh -huh. because then exposure-wise, you know, it's, it's not the best. In terms of academics, yes, you'll be very academic, uh -huh. but in terms of using your own hands to put up CVPs, IC drains, uh -huh. there's and always someone. Important. And that's important because then in concert year, you're going to a district hospital and you are now the senior. Uh -huh. Now you're the senior, a step chest comes in, you need to put up a drain, but during internship, your registrar was putting up the drain. Uh -huh. And now you're uncomfortable yeah. putting up um, 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 central lines. There's always somebody else to do it for you uh, because it's a big hospital. It's a specialized hospital. So when you add like big-ish hospitals, so your Tembisas, um Eden Vale, Tama Tam Memorial, those for me are hospitals that students should go to. Absolutely. Go to these places. They have enough supervision. They have enough registrars, but you're not competing uh, with a registrar to do a procedure. Okay, you'll take us through that because I think that's also very important mm. in terms of like what registers are. So you did your internship in um, Timbisa for two for years. For two years, correct. For two years. Yes. Okay. So you you can't let's say do your internship in Timbisa and next day you do it in Timbisa. Yeah. So people say you can, but it's so much red tape and bureaucracy that I think it's it's absolutely ridiculous. People try to swap. 
So let's say now, um, like now I got recent, I recently married. If my husband was in KZN, for example, during my internship year, uh -huh. then I would try to work with an intern in KZN to come to Gauteng. Uh -huh. So we're basically just taking each other's spots. Uh -huh. But you'd have to find someone at, who's, who's started at the same time as you and is finishing at the same time as you and has done the same rotations as you've done. Oh yeah, Kona, yeah, also, like, you, the same way you did not start at the same time. Exactly, you so you are asynchronous, to... somebody else is synchronous, so we started in January. Yeah. And then there are those, maybe, you started in Peds uh, and Gaini, and they did surgery and whatever. So when you swap, you have to have done the same, the same um, rotations, because now you're taking over from where the person left off. Mm. So it, it, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of red tape to, to do it. But people have done it. They have swapped mm. um, hospitals during internship. So then in internship, how many hours do you work? Do you do call? You are, I don't know that. Guys, internship is the pits, is right? It? It's the pits. Honestly, it's the pits. But if you can survive internship, a lot of people say if you can just survive internship, mm -hmm. life gets better. Mm -hmm. um, and I will somewhat attest to that, that if you can just survive internship, it does get a little better. Um... So you allegedly, allegedly, please, it's very alleged. Yeah, yeah. You and work also, 80 it's hours. Your opinion. And it's my it's opinion. Yes, yes. Also. Oh. You work, what, 80 hours a week, but you never work 80 hours a week. Really? That's a lie. Mm -hmm. There are departments where you have to come in at 7 o'clock for a whole round, right? According to HR, you had work from 8 until 4. Uh -huh. But in this department, they want you to come in at 7. And at 4 o'clock, you're not done. You can't just leave uh, work not done and you end up looking at what time at six. So at the end of the week, you've worked more than 80 hours, uh, especially in things like pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology, and like surgery. You never really work the amount of hours that you are supposed to work according to the HPCSA. So please explain what is called post call. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay, so calls for us are, are, are overtime, right? So overtime meaning. Uh, hours outside of your normal eight to four. Uh -huh. So this is when you are at the you are the doctor working overnight in that specialty. Uh -huh. So you're just seeing those patients that night. That's if you work at a, at a hospital where um, calls up a department. But if, for example, you're working at a district hospital, you all call in casualty. So when people leave at four o'clock and they go home, you stay and you go to casualty. Uh -huh. Right. So in other hospitals you call in the department in which you work on a daily basis. So if you're in obstetrics, you will be calling in labor ward and theater. Okay. If you are in surgery, again, you'll be in casualties, the wards and that kind of vibe. Uh -huh. So the whole issue of pre-call, post-call and the call itself. Uh -huh. The pre-call is this, that if your call starts at 4 o'clock, from 8 a.m. to 4 o'clock, you are at home, you're not at work. That is your pre-call. Uh. Your post-call is you've worked the whole night through. It's now 8 a.m. You've handed over to the, um, the morning team and now you're supposed to go home. Uh. So that's the post-call. Uh -huh. But this doesn't always happen this way, yeah. right? So the hospitals where you don't get a pre-call, you don't get a post-call. Oh, so you work from okay. 8 a.m. today, finish your call at 8 a.m. the following day uh. and then continue the day's work. Uh. And then only once the day's work is finished can you go home. Okay, yeah. so explain to us the hierarchy, like you go through internship, mm. concert, please take us to the, sure. up until you become a specialist. Sure, okay. So you start out, Shem, as a, an ambitious doctor with a glow in your eyes, uh -huh. and you are a student intern, uh -huh. right? Sixth year. So this is before you're an actual doctor, but you're a student intern. Uh -huh. um, and people treat you like a doctor mostly. But student intern, you don't get paid. You don't get paid, no honey. You don't get paid, you're still a student. So you're a student intern. Um, so you do your calls as well at the hospital, but you're a student intern. So it starts uh -huh. basically from the sixth year student. Okay. Then you come to first and second year of internship. Uh -huh. So an in internship, you're still a doctor. I think this is the, the, the difference between our career and many other careers where an intern is not um, yeah. somebody who is um, qualified yet, yeah. they're still learning. Because people so, think it is that. Mm, so for us, as an intern, you're still a doctor. Mm. You are a qualified doctor, you've got your degree, you are allowed to work, but it's considered part of your teaching years because apparently long, long ago, when medicine was like 10 years to study, internship was part was of... Was it a time of yeah, 10 years? It was like 9 years or something. Yes, it was quite long. So internship was counted as part of your student time. Uh -huh. Okay. 
that all got scrapped. So now as an intern, you've graduated, you are now a fully fledged doctor. Uh -huh. So you do two years of internship. So this is when you rep rotate through the major disciplines, obstetrics, pediatrics, internal medicine, orthopedics, anesthetics, um, what's that one? Family medicine, yes, right? Um, some of them you spend three months in a department and family medicine is now, I think it's six months or three months. I think it's three months now, yes. It was previously six months, sorry. Um, so you rotate through all those, those things in those two years. Uh. And then you have to get signed off by your heads of departments and your... When you finish your rotation. When you finish your rotation, okay. yes. And at the so end, you have a logbook, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. So you flash your logbook, your procedures, all those things. And then at the end, you have to get signed off. Uh-huh. You can sign up for internship, and again, you go through ICSP, you put in your details on the website, and you put in your choices for your community service um, hospitals. And you pray to God that you get your hospital, and then that's where you go. Uh -huh. So, come serve, you are now a community service medical officer. Yeah. So, there's a bit more respect to your name, you know? And the interns mm -hmm. expect a lot. So, you, a lot is expected of you. Uh -huh. In terms of now watching over your interns, so that's why you need to go to a place where in internship you are well trained. That when you get to community service, and now you have to be a senior doctor, you really know what you're doing lead. exactly. Mm. So that's community service. You are still so um, internship and community service are mandatory, okay. right? You can't skip these two and now just go uh -uh, from internship. I'm just going to start studying to be a, a specialist. You can't. It doesn't uh, work that way. Uh. So internship, community service, mandatory years. After community service, you are what we call an independent medical practitioner. So this is where you can decide, I'm going to private, I'm going to a GP, um, I'm going to open my own little thing, because now you're an independent medical practitioner. Do so whatever you want. So this is where then you have to reapply. Now you have to actually take your CV uh -huh. to hospitals and look for a job. So a concept is a year. Concept, concept is one year, uh -huh. and you apply for your job and you are placed by government okay right through the icsp system okay but as a medical officer now you must rewrite so you must go through the things that you never went through writing a cv oh, preparing okay. your mind for an interview oh, yeah. because in terms of your place comes of uh, your place so uh, those three years the job is always yours uh, now is medical officer time uh, now you must be a big doctor so you go around drop cvs look online for jobs go for the interview and then you get your job right so the medical officer um you are not in that post to be a specialist. So you are just a doctor working in that department who's post from serve, right? However, if you are now um, a registrar, you are studying towards being a specialist. So registrar meaning you are studying towards being, let's say, an anesthesiologist. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, all departments can have registrars because registrars are just people or registrar posts are just posts for people who want to become specialists in that department. The registrar then completes the four to five years of training, right? Uh -huh. And they become a specialist, so they become a consultant. At this, at this point, they can then choose to go to private practice, open their own practice, uh -huh. or stay in government, or do all three. Uh -huh. no? That's the consultant. If the consultant chooses, they can then go back to school so become a fellow and study something specific within the field they specialized in. Uh. So if, for example, I did um, surgery, I can just focus on breast. So I am a super specialist in breast surgery, uh -huh. for example, or in thyroid disease, or um, some of them do hepatobiliary. So they just focus on the liver and the biliary system. So you are already a consultant. You are now super specializing or sub specializing in something within that specialty. Yo, guys, no, like this is so cool. In order for you to do that, you know, or if you want, you have the desire to do it, is there more money? Like, more, more, more money in order for you like, to struggle <laughs> in this? Because, like, I see the liver, right? Yes. Then you want to go into the. Just the liver only. Like, yeah. You don't want to work with anything else. I know, I understand. Mm. But, like, you. It, for you to go to like the um the hepato biliary mm. like just that remember the, the the more super specialized you are the more in demand you are the more in demand you are okay. the more you can control the supply 
So you can say for me to see like a single patient, mm, okay. my consultation is three thousand. Okay. Right? No, because you're the only one in that field. So you're the only one who's doing, for example, breast oncology. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you're the only one who's doing uh, oncology, um, specializing in like uh, female cancers or whatever. So you have a greater pull on the market. So you okay. are more in demand. So okay. So you, all about demand. It's, it's what all about you can exactly. Say. It's, it's about what, and and again, some people just want it for academic satisfaction mm -hmm. that they got to a point where they were super specialist and then they were a professor, mm -hmm. and you get all these accolades. Mm -hmm. Um. But there is no money because then you know you can be called like abroad to give talks. Like oh, okay. I, I know people who no, I understand. Like, travelled for the money and it's for free, Pela. Like, mm. If they're calling you to go give a talk because now you're so specialized and so focused on this one thing, you're basically an expert. Yeah. At that one system. Okay. No. So money makes makes the world go around. No, no, that I understand. <laughs> I didn't understand that part, but okay, yeah. There is money. Saying. There's better money, mm. I guess. Um. So then, yeah. So now you are a super specialist, right? And then let's, you can then go into academia, become a professor, become a lecturer. So, uh, professor, you still need to study, study even more, or is this just the opportunity you um, can get? So, I think with being a professor, you have to go into some sort of research and write your thesis and then present your, your research. Mm. And then, should it pass, then you'll be called a professor. Okay. No, so even that. in that, like it's a, I think it's a very long journey. Uh -huh. Like some people honestly, once they're specialist, they're like I'm happy. I've made it to being a specialist. I'm okay. But obviously, it depends on what you want in terms of your own academic satisfaction and your own academic pursuit. Uh -huh. Yeah, because as you said, that you at some point you need to tell yourself, okay, or what hey, like I'm, that I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Way I'm done. done. The because also it's also a lot. A lot. Yes. And, and for women as well. Life. You're, you're, you're thinking, my life, my family, do I want to be a present mom? You know, am mm -hmm. I being a present mom? And so not just I want the money, but I also want to be able to take my kids at night. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I'm going to go back to school to be a registrar, and then from that to be a consultant and a fellow, and I might be, co I might be called in at 2 a.m. for someone saying, hey, I have this patient and they're really sick, I need you now. Am I willing to leave my husband, my warm bed, my kids at 2 a.m. and drive to the hospital? And be present and and, and 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 do the right thing for my patients you know uh, so i think a lot of times especially with the registrars it's a very tough journey you can see that it's a tough journey from the people who are in it and when you ask them one someone once said to me if you're not married before registrar time don't get married during it because it's one of the causes of people fighting because you're never there i mean I'm, I'm marrying you and you are on call three times a week uh, so and you don't get post call, so I hardly get to see you. And now, some women will say, I don't want to have kids during rage time because I don't want to prolong my rage time. Mm -hmm. Remember, if I'm, I'm, if I'm pregnant, I'm mm -hmm. gonna take maternity yeah. leave. Mm -hmm. If I take maternity leave, I'm prolonging my registrar time. So, there's and there's so much hate within the fraternity itself that people get angry at you when you now have to go on leave, on sick leave, on maternity leave because mm -hmm. they are one person down. Me, other people have to cover all the calls that you should be covering, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a very toxic field. You need to you need to choose your why and you need to choose your fight. If yeah. you are resilient and tenacious and very ambitious, go for it. But if not, it's okay to be a medical officer and not specialize. It's okay post concert to take a year and travel. It's literally okay. It's what you, it's, like. it's what you want and what works for your own mental health. Uh, uh. Um, we were having a discussion. I went to a course recently and we were having a discussion about people who actually kill themselves in these programs. So sometimes a registrar, you're, 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 you're a student, and so you get consultants who are so mean to you, who will belittle you, call you names, uh. in front of students. And to, so it, they try, it's like punitive teaching, people are embarrassing you and humiliating you to try and teach you something. And so some people get to a point where they're like, you know what, I'm, I'm done. They just walk out of the registrar program. People who've, who've lived third year registrar. Yo, and you at the... You at the... Yeah. Like, you're, you're, you're almost there, and you just leave the program. Because it's so taxing. Mm -hmm. It's really, really taxing. So medicine is a beautiful career. Um, it takes a lot of work, even after graduating, to get to the top of the ladder. But there is satisfaction. Really, at the top or at the bottom of the ladder, you still serve people. Mm -hmm. And you can still be um, satisfied personally with the work you're giving back to people. Mm -hmm. So it should never feel 
um, mandatory for you to go back to school because I want to be a consultant. It's it's not the way it all ends. People have money going into aesthetics, mm. doing Botoxes, mm. doing you know people get money from that, and they're not even consultants in in dermatology. Yeah, because also it's about the market. It's you know, everyone wants facial, exactly. everyone wants drugs, So you know? honestly, you don't have to go the classic root of medicine people go into sports medicine mm. and they are doctors to, uh, to soccer teams and and rugby teams and boxing and that's money mm. that's money you can go and be somebody's personal private doctor and if that person is money enough they're gonna put you with other people who are money like them and by the time you know it you are drawn to the stars mm. and you, so True. honestly don't feel forced to go through the classic doctor route there are other ways to make money in medicine and honestly, it's all about satisfaction, giving back to your patients. The money's an extra, but of course, money's important. <laughs> yeah, you still the thing. Lebo, this has been such a fruitful conversation. Yeah. What, like, how has your experience been so far in medicine? Are you enjoying it? The good? <laughs> so, I mean, there are good days and bad days mm. in every field, right? However, I I know I've, I have a calling for medicine. I have a calling to serve. Uh -huh. And I believe my serving God is serving his people as well. Uh -huh. So this is where I belong. Uh -huh. But for a lot of people, medicine can get very depressing because it's not something you're called to. It's something that maybe your marks were good or your parents forced you into it. So there's not really a lot of passion. But personally, I have enjoyed it. Um, when you work with like-minded like, like people, people are also hardworking. It feels good. You go to work. And you think, ah, oh, I had a great day today because mm. you had a team of people who were working with you and you have saved a patient's life and, and you had a good day. But there are bad days where you lose children, you have patients who are not compliant and they're dying and you've, you've said the biggest English, you've said the smallest English Yo, and you're still not getting to bad them. Bad. And those are the bad days that make you appreciate the good days. Uh. So overall, if you want to be a doctor, do it. It's a beautiful career, it's a fulfilling career. But it's a tough career, honestly. Even of, as, even as a specialist, you know, they're still getting sued. Imagine as a specialist, you are there in court, a patient is suing you for a complication they had. So it's a, it's a, it's a career that needs a very thick skin. Not just for, in the beginning, until the end, you need to be thick skinned and really, really, really be passionate about what you're doing. Otherwise, it's going to drain you. Uh. You can't be in this thing and not like it. Like it's, it's draining. It's it becomes very monotonous to go to work come back, see patients, and you end up not being much of a help. It just becomes, it's, it's the doctors that you see that have just been there and they're over it and they're not really helping much. They're just doing it. So if you want to really be a good doctor, you you go over and above, isn't it? You you study more, you're more patient. You, you keep praying for wisdom because like, hey, it's not easy. It's not easy, yeah. it's not easy. but if you want it, do it. Okay. No, but I not for my kids. My kids should not be doctors. I'm sorry. Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> you must go through something with money. At, at when, least. No, no, this is this is my desire for my kids. When mm -hmm. God bless me with kids, it must be kids who are not doctors. Uh -huh. It must be kids who go into something where they can, like at two o'clock they're done for the day, uh -huh. and there's massive money in their account, right? They're not worried about your is that patient gonna survive. You know what I mean? It might be like things like I don't know whatever things have money, and you have Christmas off and you have weekends off. Those kinds of things where their family. Like, it's family friendly. Medicine is not always family friendly, no lies. Like, you have to make it family friendly for yourself. You have to intentionally set the time to focus on your friends and the things that you like. Otherwise, uh, you are ever good. Yeah. I think you've also answered the question where I wanted to ask what advice would you give for mm. a person who wants to do medicine? Because everyone wants to be a doctor. It's mm. just that the marks are in up like disappointing mm. them. Or like, yes, you become a doctor. I've seen this in age students, like especially in high school and everything. Head girls and everything. Mm. Yeah, they have nineties and everything, but they don't get it. No, they do get it. Okay, they get sure. into medicine, but then drop it's out. Gone. And a lot of them, it's just yeah. It's do just your research. Thing. Do your research. Medicine is not great anatomy. It's not the good doctor. Yeah, hey, it's hey. not. What was that South African one with the doctors on TV? That one was playing on DSTV. I can't remember now. ETV. Yeah, that hey. one. Uh, Dorin Jane. It's <laughs> honey. Get that picture out of your mind right medicine is a lot of suffering with a smile on your face it's a lot of late nights early mornings fatigue so we all think you're a doctor wow white coat to hey hey what what show me he's a tough road it's nice Satisfaction and people see you like oh doctor oh doctor 
but they don't know that you just counseled a family who's losing their child and you are smiling with them. They don't know that you haven't seen your family in two days and that your relationship is breaking up because you have no time for your partner. Mm. They don't know that you are not qualifying for court, for, for posts, like you're starting to find a job. There are doctors out there who are unemployed. Yeah. So when I say do your research, I really, really mean from the bottom of my heart that you can be a doctor and be unemployed. So these are things that you need to bear in mind, that it's not the, the, the glitz and glam that we see what of what we think is, is hollywood and is, is being a doctor medicine can also be tough medicine can break people's souls so if you're not convinced that's what you want to do don't go into it like don't, don't try like it's not a like situation it's really once you're in you're in so yeah pray about it think about it be sure and if you're not sure take some time off find yourself you'll be fine Yes. Yeah, I think that is perfect. Thank you, buddies, for watching. I'll see you guys on the next episode. And please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, please follow Lebu. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.